had a really interesting time this weekend revising this lecture because when I got to 1929 and started reading about the 1930s, it was, it was like deja vu and not really uh, because that was the period of the Great Depression. And right now, we're going through something that's extremely similar. Uh, they're calling it a recession, but it's been lasting quite a while now. And um, so, anyway, you'll see in terms of what I incorporated here. Last week, you remember, um, we looked at the impact of the Armory Show um, on American art in 1913. Um, in fact, ultimately, even though many of the works of modern European art in the Armory Show sold um, to certain uh, patrons um, in America in the early 20th century, the full stylistic impact, particularly of the importance of abstraction um, in art um, would not um, be apparent for years to come in America. There were new galleries and new museums, however, that um, are uh, begun, um, are erected, uh, and, um, uh, and they are important in terms of the establishment of modern sensibilities in America. Cubism, which was the dominant stylistic approach of the early 20th century, was really very little understood or incorporated into the work of American artists of the early 20th century. In fact, the majority of Americans who call themselves Cubists um, really were just kind of translating reality into more um, angles and sharp lines. The American painter Marsden Hartley exhibited at 291. What was 291? Of whose gallery was it? This might be on the final. Alfred Stieglitz, yes. Between 1912 and 1915, Hartley was in Europe where he studied Cubism in Paris and then um, he went to study German Expressionism in Berlin. By the beginning of World War I, which you remember begins in 1914, Hartley had painted um, a work that shows his um, understanding and his um, uh, approach to um, synthetic cubism. Um, this is his most famous work, in fact, a series of flag paintings that he did. This is called Portrait of a German Officer, 1914. Now, obviously, this is not a traditional portrait, which we might not expect in any case from an artist using the Cubist aesthetic. It's a work based on pulling apart and recombining elements of reality, including colorful shapes, symbols, numbers, and letters. We have seen similar things going on in synthetic cubist works of approximately the same period of time. While living in Berlin, Hartley began a relationship with a 24-year-old German soldier named Karl von Freiburg. F-R-E-Y-B-U-R-G. Von Freiburg was killed at the front in October of 1914. And this painting is often seen as a kind of memorial to Hartley's dead lover. We begin with the morning color of black which dominates the background and then the brilliant colors um, of the foreground with abstract patterns um, and symbols that, as I said earlier, have um, a certain kind of significance. For instance, Freiburg's um, initials are inscribed in the lower left-hand corner um, here. Again, his name uh, was Karl von Freiburg, um, while his age at death um, was 24. There is an iron cross here at the top, which was awarded to the young soldier the day before he was killed. Um, and below that is his regiment number. 
Um, there are other details, especially the, um, the E um, here, uh, and we seem to have it repeated again, uh, which uh, a number of different authorities interpret um, in different ways. But it's clearly a very personal uh, uh, painting um, on the part of Marston Hartley. The blue and white diamond pattern is significant as a reference to the flag of Bavaria. And in fact, the red, white, and black striped flag is the flag of the German Empire. So we're talking about something that's deeply rooted um, in the tradition um, of uh, Germany. Uh, and um, Hartley's really bringing all that um, together. A number of reviewers were offended by what, what, by what appeared to be a very pro-German stance um, on the part um, of Hartley. Now, it's interesting that the only non-objective movement at this time originated by Americans had nothing to do with America or even the implications of the Armory Show. Three American artists were living in Paris by 1907 and formulated a movement called Synchromism. Synchromism. S-Y-N-C-H-R. O-M-I-S-M. -S Again, S-Y-N-C-H-R-O-M-I-S-M. -S you can see that same term used in the title of this work by, work by Morgan Russell, Synchromy in Orange to Form, 1913-1914. I'm going to mention two of the artists. One is Morgan Russell. The other is Stanton MacDonald um, Wright. Um, these artists studied Cezanne and decided that they, too, wanted to recreate nature. They were also fascinated by the scientific theories uh, that had come out of the 19th century and even the early 20th centuries regarding color and color theory. Synchromism, in fact, as a term, would be translated with color. So that formal element is what drives the work of the artists associated with the movement. In Synchrony and Orange to Form, um, Morgan Russell is um, uh, really interrelating and trying to understand properties and relationships of color in a, in a very sculptural, sort of hard-edged approach that does, in fact, look a little bit like early Cubism or going back a little bit more, even a little bit like Cezanne. But it's a very original work. Um, and it's a work which, uh, again, seems to embrace non-objectivity. But this is not in the United States. This is in Paris. So these are like expatriates. The other work I want to look at is this one, Abstraction on Spectrum, Organization 5, by Stanton MacDonald Wright. Since the artists associated with synchromism were in Paris between 1912 and 1913, when Robert Delaunay and Franciscep Kupka were creating their non-objective uh, works, which they referred to, if you remember, as Orphism, probably on the final, there are still arguments over who invented what first. Russell and MacDonald Wright equated their theory of color to music. So like so many artists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, again, the idea of music as the kind of ultimate um, art. The color synchromies were composed with supposedly chords, dominant and subdominant keys, harmonies and dissonance. So there's very specific reference to music um, in these works. So if you want to look at non-objective, American non-objective art, you, as I said, you have to go to Paris to see what um, these expatriate Americans are doing. In America, the most significant homegrown uh, movement was a movement of abstraction, but it's not non-objective. 
It's called precisionism. P-R-E-C-I-S-I-O-N-I-S-M. Precisionism. A movement formally based in knowledge of the geometric um, abstraction of forms of cubism. So cubism is introduced to the United States by 1913 with the Armory Show, and a number of artists begin to experiment uh, with cubism. But again, as I said, taking over the cubist aesthetic by understanding it as sort of just geometricizing things and using angled lines and uh, so forth doesn't mean that you really understand um, cubism. Precision is combined what they understood of cubism. They also were interested in futurism, particularly its celebration of technology and speed, because they felt that the futurists in many ways in terms of their philosophy we're closer to the American dream, American uh, technology and speed. The precisionists um, even painted American landscape and regional culture uh, as um, emphasizing this more mechanical, industrialized America. This work is called Machinery, and it's by the precisionist Charles DeMuth. Instead of fragmenting an object to the point of non-recognizability, which we saw happening in analytical cubism, the precision is simply simplified and arranged nature in such a way to emphasize a greater purity of shape and line and structure. For this reason, precisionism has also been called cubist realism. I know these different names are going to drive you insane. I'm sorry. DeMuth had studied at the Pennsylvania Academy. Then he went to Paris in 1912. 1912, I always think of synthetic cubism. Cubism and futurism, which he was steeped in um, in France, both had an impact on his approach to subjects, but subjects were American subjects, celebrating America's cities, America's highways, America's factories. Machinery, which was owned by Alfred Stieglitz, shows a kind of industrial landscape, sort of isolated um, here. It was inspired by DeMuth's hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which was a city dominated by factories and other factory buildings, and what was called a, a quote-unquote cyclone separator. And so that's what's represented here, um, a cyclone um, separator, kind of centrifuge um, apparatus at one of the uh, factories. We see the use here of um, elements of a factory building, including windows and walls, and again, the actual machinery uh, brought together to create a very cubist or cubist realist uh, kind of painting. This work is on the final. Church Street L, Charles Sheeler, again, precisionist. This is a really great work because it's almost like an optical illusion where you, at one point you feel like you are looking down, that there is a kind of realistic perspective and that you're plunging down, uh, looking uh, down closer to the street and the sides of buildings. On the other hand, it's so two-dimensional and flat in terms of the flattened um, areas of color um, and line. Charles Sheeler was also from Philadelphia. He started his career as a professional photographer in around 1910. He was living in New York by 1919. And in this painting, Church Street L, and L is for elevated, you know, the elevated trains. 
He eliminates detail to focus attention, again, as I was saying, on the interaction of flattened shapes, color, and light. We're actually supposedly on the top of the Empire State Building in New York, looking down at other buildings, um, including the Trinity Church. Here you can sort of see a steeple here, but the rest of it has been simplified. And on the right-hand side, um, an elevated train, which we see the top of, and then we see the tracks represented. But again, you know, we're, we're searching very, very hard to find these sort of realistic details. There's a sense of energy and movement, particularly once we understand that that's a train, uh, so that we can understand how Sheeler is really trying to incorporate futurist ideas um, into, um, into his work. Sheeler's series of photographs of the Ford Motor Company plant near Detroit was commissioned by Ford through an advertising agency. <coughs> this is Crisscross Conveyors River Rouge Plant, Ford Motor Company, 1927. Sheeler produced a whole series of photographic images that express, ultimately, the power, the preeminence of American industrial technology in the early 20th century. Clearly, um, some subjects lent themselves more easily than others to um, his desire to emphasize line and flat uh, planes. Um, this is a very geometric, uh, these are very geometric subjects that we're looking at, and that's what, how it tends to come out um, in, the, um, in the photograph itself. In 1929, two years um, after Sheeler photographed the Ford Motor Company, the stock market crashed. You do know that on Friday of last week, the stock market, and this is now June, the stock market um, dropped so many points, it was over 200 some points, that all of the gains for the entire year, and we are now at the halfway point of the year, were wiped out. Did you know that? That's extremely scary. Um, so in any case, that's what made me think about do you all really have any concept of the Great Depression? Because again, I keep thinking, wow, there seem to be so many uh, similarities. We're going to talk about the decade of the 30s in America, from the fall of the stock market to the beginning of World War II um, in terms of art. But um, I found a great BBC um, video, and I cut it down a little bit. It's just over 30 minutes um, in length. And um, I just think it's excellent to set us into an historical context um, to talk about what happens in America. How do people react? How do artists react? Ten years of depression. Um, so, in any case, here's the Daily Mail. The greatest crash in Wall Street's history um, only matched by what happened in fall, the fall of 2008. Years of booming prosperity ended in catastrophe. It was the biggest stock market crash since records began. It is impossible to underestimate the shock, a sense of stunned disbelief. First time investors borrowed huge amounts of money to speculate on the market. The market broke very sharply and a lot of people were wiped out with it. It was very painful. Later, thousands of banks failed. Millions lost everything. The poverty was really all around us. It was really, really pitiful. The crash was followed by a depression that spread across the world, lasted for a decade, and was a prelude to war. This is the story of a financial disaster that we hoped would never happen again. 
23rd of October 1929. Without warning, share prices are plummeting on the New York Stock Exchange. Investors are stunned. For the last five years, the market has only gone up. In the space of an hour, a staggering two and a half million shares are sold. Next day, the downward spiral continues. As people came in to trade stocks on October 24th, there was a sense that maybe something had changed, that there was something different. All of a sudden, there just weren't buyers. People were willing to sell, but there weren't buyers coming forth to buy the stocks. And prices began to fall $2, $4, $10 a share. It was sort of horrifying. That morning, there were drops on the stock exchange. It was so sharp and so dire. And stocks suddenly dropping 10, 20, 30 points at a time that it's said that there were shrieks and gasps in the gallery of the New York Stock Exchange. People were stunned by what is happening and terrified. Thousands of people begin to gather outside the stock market. 10,000 people. They fill the streets from Broadway to the East River. People want to know what's going on if they went there. These huge crowds gathered around the stock exchange, around the statues and on the stairs, waiting to get any kind of news they could as people came out of the exchange. They could hear voices. They could actually hear the shouting and yelling as people were buying and selling. But they didn't know what was going on, so they gathered and they stayed there to find out. A few of the thousands waiting in the crowd appreciated the scale of the disaster that was about to unfold. Nor could they imagine that over the next five days, a financial catastrophe would sweep away the foundations of America's prosperity. But to understand what brought about the crash, we need to go back a decade to a time when American confidence grew so high that it seemed the good times would last forever. <laughs> In 1919, the U.S. had emerged victorious from World War I. A mood of optimism was in the air. Britain and its European allies were exhausted financially from the war. The U.S. economy was thriving, and the world danced to the American tune. The uncertainty for us. There seemed little doubt about what was going to happen. America was going on the greatest, gaudiest spree in history, and there was going to be plenty to tell about. In the 1920s, everyday life was changing. Electrification transformed America. Towns were hooked up to the grid. New technologies emerged. Airplanes, radios, domestic goods that had started life as luxuries now became necessities. The car industry also moved as people flocked to buy one of the new Ford or Chrysler automobiles. An era of boundless prosperity seemed to have begun. With easy credit and more disposable income, Americans were now looking for new ways to get even richer. Since World War I, the US government had sold bonds, known as Liberty Bonds, to pay for the war. This was a way to borrow money from the public who in turn would receive interest payments on the bond's value. Celebrities such as Charlie Chaplin and Douglas Fairbanks had been recruited to promote them at huge rabbits. Liberty bonds caused many people to become investors in securities for the first time. For the first time in their lives, they got interest payments every six months, and the security was something they could trade on the market so they could look in the newspaper and see what the price of my bond is today. Liberty Bonds created an investing culture. Most people had never purchased securities before, and it got ordinary people accustomed to buying securities. Now there was another group of people who thought they could take advantage of this new investing culture. The bankers of Wall Street. For years, Wall Street, the center of American finance, was made up of a small elite group of bankers doing business with each other in a society closed off to the general public. But one man saw an opportunity that would change the face of the financial world. Charles Mitchell, 
President of National City Bank, sporting a lucrative gap, Mayan. Mitchell saw that investors had purchased a lot of government bonds during World War I. And so he said, now we have an investing public there. All we need to do is market other products like corporate bonds, common stocks, and just tell people these are respectable investments. Mitchell was a natural salesman with a big ambition. If people were willing to buy bonds to raise capital for government, Surely they could be tempted to buy stocks and shares to raise capital for private companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And they could make a profit for themselves in the process. Gradually, people who never dreamed that they would invest in stocks were doing so when stocks lost a lot of their stigma. Historically, stocks have been considered much too risky for ordinary people. Uh, whereas in the 1920s, there was a sense that investing in stocks was not only safe, but reliable and respectable. The idea took off, and to exploit this lucrative new market, Mitchell opened brokerage offices all across the country, where people who had the money but not the investment know-how could speculate in stocks and shares. This speculative frenzy embraced all kinds of people, not just professionals. Ordinary people began participating as well in unprecedented numbers all across the country, not just New York City, but in cities and small towns all across America. People were in love with the stock market. Technology made it all possible. The latest share prices flashed from Wall Street could be printed out within minutes across America using telegraphic ticker tape machines. People had so much faith in the bull market that they borrowed with increasing sums of money to speculate on rising share prices. This way of buying shares was known as buying on margin. The investor was required to put down only part of the money with their broker funding the rest. The culture of buy now, pay later had spread to the stock market. Buying stocks on margin means essentially that you're buying them with borrowed money. By the late 1920s, 90% of the purchase price of the stock is being made with borrowed money. There were no rules about how much you could borrow, and people borrowed enormous sums of money to buy stocks. You could buy a $100 stock for $25, and then, and then the brokerage firm would loan you the other 75. And if the stock went up, and in the late 20s, everything seemed to go up and up, then that $25 could turn into investment that was worth 200 or 300. So it became a huge part of the US economy to loan money for the stock market. In fact, um, in the late 1920s, nearly 40 cents of, of every dollar loaned was for stock. This vast influx of borrowed money into the stock market created more demand for shares, pushing prices ever upwards. In 1928, the market went up by almost 50% in just 12 months. And as stocks continued to rise, more and more investors borrowed money to get a piece of the action. One of them was shoeshine boy Pat Bologna. My father didn't have a lot of money in the stock market. They told me at the time he had about $6,000 in cash. But remember, $6,000 in cash translated into a lot of stock because in those years, you only had to put 10% down for margin. So at $6,000, you could have $60,000 worth of stock. Wall Street was hungry for new hunters. There was one group of would-be investors that the street had always ignored, but whose money it now wanted. Up until the 1920s, women had played a very small role in the stock market. Part of this was, was simply gender prejudice. They were considered incapable of the kind of cool sang froid that was necessary to speculate in the market. But in the 20s, part of the popularization of the stock market included huge numbers of women well, the 20s were a big time for women anyway. They really stepped out on their own. They began to take control of their own money. They went to college, actually, in record numbers in the 1920s. 
And uh, as they did that, they also got interested in the stock market and it is a way for them to build their own wealth. Throughout the soaring market of the 1920s, the Republican Party stayed in power on the back of America's increasing prosperity. Calvin Coolidge became president in 1923 and invested himself. He was notably silent on the speculative mania gripping Wall Street. Calvin Coolidge typifies the laissez-faire, devil-may-care uh, recklessness of the 1920s. He's famous for saying that the business of America is business. It was a prosperous period. Business was making money. Wall Street was making money. Uh, the politicians, I think, just said, well, every, everything's fine. The economy is growing. The market takes care of things pretty well, and the government's job is to get out of the way. While amateur speculators were transfixed by the soaring value of their investments, they were hopelessly unaware of how Wall Street really worked. With little government supervision, the market was a law unto itself. And inside the beauty was rife. There was a lot of market manipulation going on. It was rampant. There was no disclosure at all to speak of. And when Wall Street was very small and very self-contained, that was probably okay. But as people like you and me began to put our heart and money into the market, then it really mattered. The stock market of the 1920s was neither fair nor democratic. It was a big gambling casino, and it was rigged by professional speculators. As smaller investors gambled with their life savings, they failed to realize that the odds were stacked against them. Men like Joseph Kennedy did not make their fortunes by simply picking the right stocks. The truth was that they were cashing in on the naivety of gullible newcomers. A bunch of sharp speculators would get together and in coordinated fashion, they would start quietly but relentlessly buying an individual stock. What they would do is hype up a particular stock, buy it up themselves, and then dump it on the market so that they took the profits while the average investor in those stocks were left with the losings. Even some of the elite investment houses on Wall Street were engaged in this type of market manipulation. In March of 1929, a new Republican president, Herbert Hoover, was inaugurated. In his address, he reassured Americans. We have reached a higher degree of comfort and security than ever existed before in the history of the world. But behind the scenes, he was less confident. Hoover is actually skeptical about what's going on on Wall Street and the economy generally, but he doesn't have the political courage of his convictions. And so when he becomes president, he does nothing to rein in this wild speculative fervor. He doesn't do anything to encourage the Federal Reserve or the Treasury to tighten up margin speculation in the stock market. In private, Hoover talked of an orgy of speculation, but like his predecessor Coolidge, he had no appetite for regulation of the marketplace. Yet Hoover was not alone in his fears that the stock market bubble might be about to burst. Days after the inauguration speech, a prominent and highly respected banker, Paul Warburg, broke ranks with the Wall Street aristocracy and issued a bleak warning. If orgies of unrestrained speculation are permitted to spread too far, the ultimate collapse is certain to bring about a general depression involving the entire country. Warburg's prediction fell on deaf ears, and between May and September 1929, 60 new companies were floating on the New York Stock Exchange, adding more than 100 million shares to the marketplace, fueling the investment bubble. In September, the market became increasingly volatile. Behind closed doors, President Hoover's unease was growing. Herbert Hoover did keep making inquiries among his Wall Street friends, asking if he should be concerned, and he received a memo from Thomas W. Lamont, who was the senior partner of J.P. Morgan and Company, 
grandfather said in that letter, the market will correct itself and it doesn't appear to, it would not appear to be any need for any kind of government intervention in the market. Lamont reassured Hoover that there was absolutely no cause for concern and the memo ended with the line, the future appears brilliant. Five days later, the stock market crashed. No one knows what triggered the sudden loss of confidence that happened at the end of Wednesday, 23rd of October. But out of nowhere, a sharp fall in automobile stocks provoked a frantic last hour's trading. Millions of shares were suddenly sold. The next day, the great crash of 1929 began. October 24th, 1929, Black Thursday is often considered to be the beginning of the crash. There was really a tremendous drop which scared a lot of people. It is impossible to underestimate the shock, a sense of stunned disbelief. People panic as the market just drops and drops and drops. Desperate for news, thousands gathered outside the stock exchange. Tremendous crowds standing there, very grimly staring at it, and had just been wiped out. City officials are so alarmed by that they send 400 mounted police, fearing that there's going to be a kind of Bastille-like invasion of, uh, of the stock exchange. And it's said that there was a strange murmur in the air, that there was a very, very strange and haunting sound, which must have been the cumulative voices of all of these uh, people sharing their concerns. Once the crash is underway, the real question becomes, one of confidence. When you lose all confidence in the economy, good and bad go down together. And so the chief investment elite is at great pains to try to restore that confidence, to convince people that the economy and the stock market is sound. The bankers knew they had to do something to avert a total financial meltdown. The Times journalists watched events unfold. The crowd grew thicker and noisier. And then there was an eddy in the middle of it. And a man in shirt sleeves was pushing his way across the street in the direction of the Morgan offices. This was Charles E. Mitchell, chairman of the National City Bank. He pushed his way into the offices of the House of Morgan, and a little later, he learned what he'd gone for. Charles Mitchell had been summoned to a meeting at the offices of J.P. Morgan. Around the table were four other leading bankers, including Richard Whitney, vice president of the New York Stock Exchange. These were some of the wealthiest businessmen in America, representing around $6 billion in assets. The chairman was Thomas Lamont. I think it was a great shock to grandfather. He did not foresee that anything like the great crash that took place, what happened? Grandfather called a meeting at his office at 23 Wall Street with some of the leading bankers in town and figured out what they could do to support the stock market, which was plunging. What they came up with was a plan to put together a pool of $250 million. And uh, those funds would be used to support a key list of stocks. At lunchtime, Richard Whitney marched across the street back to the trading floor of the stock exchange. With a huge injection of the bankers' cash, Whitney hoped to get the market moving again. Whitney parades over to the desk where U.S. Steel is being sold and buys 25,000 shares of U.S. Steel at a price well above what it was then selling for and then makes uh, a similar promenade to other blue chip stocks and makes a similar purchase. The idea being we will now restore everybody's confidence in the market. And other great financial titans of the time, including John D. Rockefeller, make similar purchases, hoping that this symbolic act will uh, turn the tide. And it worked. Such was the magical power of the Whitney name and the Morgan name that stocks suddenly turned green.
started to go up. By now, news of the meeting had leaked out, and journalists were desperate for information. Grandfather's meeting uh, with a group of reporters who were assembled on Wall Street outside of his bank office. His style was always to stay calm and never say anything that would uh, cause, uh, that would erode people's confidence in the stock market. Over the weekend, the banker's intervention seemed to have worked. Trading on Friday and Saturday was calm and uneventful. President Hoover also tried to steady nerves by repeating a mantra that has been used during market crashes many times since. The fundamental business of the country, that is production and distribution of commodities, is on a sound and prosperous basis. But in the offices of the financial district, there was total chaos. One of the things that we forget is how primitive the technology was. So many stocks traded on October 24th that it took four hours for the ticker to print all of the stock trades after the market had closed. The ticker, hopelessly swung, fell hours behind the actual trade and became completely meaningless. All night long, the lights blazed in the windows of the tall office buildings, where margin clocks and bookkeepers struggled with the desperate task of trying to clear one day's business before the next day began. They fainted at their desks. The weary runner fell exhausted on the marble floors of banks and slept. On Monday, with stock tickers running out of tape, panicking investors desperate for the latest share prices jammed the telephone lines between New York and other major cities. For the first time, many speculators were discovering the downside of easy credit and buying on margin. On Tuesday morning, some of the most famous names of corporate America saw their share price plummet. U.S. Steel, Radio, General Motors, stocks that had been symbols of the boom years. On Tuesday, there were tremendous waves of selling that just kept coming. This time, the selling was so powerful and so relentless, there was no lunchtime meeting at J.P. Morgan. Clearly, the volume of the sales overwhelmed any possibility of the bankers trying to spend the time. By evening Tuesday, all American stocks were worth about 22% less than they were when the market opened in the morning on Monday. 36 hours, you lost 22% of the value of American industry. Hoover was president, and he and Andrew Mellon, the Secretary of the Treasury, were way to the right and felt that it was not the government's job to interfere with this. They believed in pure, unfettered capitalism. And so they did very little or nothing to alleviate the crash. They said it would solve itself. The market broke very sharply, and a lot of people were wiped out with it. It was very painful. My father lost everything. He was losing everything when he was 22. He took it magnanimously. You know, it was, when you're 22, it, it, it isn't as dramatic. The people around him who were, who were you know, established people in their 50s and 60s and were losing their life savings were in absolute panic. Not everyone coped with their losses. Although the number of suicides has been exaggerated, to some, it seemed the only way out. I know that people read about the stories on Wall Street of people opening the windows in their offices and jumping out. That actually happened. That isn't an urban legend. People did commit suicide. Uh, people who had worked 30 and 40 years on Wall Street and had amassed fortunes within a period of days lost everything. The effects of the catastrophic crash in Wall Street rippled out across America. Even those who had never owned shares and who had never benefited from the stock market boom became victims too. 
The crash had undermined Americans' faith in their fragile banking system, made up of thousands of small town banks that lacked the size or reputation to convince customers that their money was safe. As confidence in the economy sank further, a domino effect began. In 1931, over 2,000 banks failed. After the crash, the banks closed. That, I think, was affected us a little more seriously, us, meaning us, the people of my stature. Um, many people had money in the bank, a little bit of money, a couple of hundred dollars, you know, thousand dollars maybe. There was no infrastructure then. There was no Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to guarantee people's deposits. There was no way to back up the banks. So if the banks uh, had made bad choices, you as a depositor paid for it. You went to go get your money, it wasn't there. And then people would hear that the bank down the street wasn't good, and they worried about their own bank, and then that would cause a run on their bank. And it, it, it became a terrible, vicious cycle. And something like 3,000 banks closed in the following couple of years after that. The whole financial system then seemed not just unstable, but uh, worthless. After that, when people saved money, they were very leery of banks, and money went under the mattress. The stock market crash in 1929 did not create the Great Depression, but it did start a sequence of events that eventually culminated with the Great uh, Depression. Well, you know, some of this is going to sound sort of familiar. The banks were loaning money for the stock market, the companies were loaning money, the brokerages were loaning money, and when that those prices fell, all that money just disappeared. Almost immediately, companies began to feel the pinch of not having the capital and having lost money, and they began to lay off people to let people go, to shut down production. There were mass bankruptcies, there was a liquidity crisis of exactly the same kind we have today. That is to say, all kinds of businesses could no longer get loans to keep themselves afloat. Even if those businesses were entirely solvent, they couldn't get the kind of short-term commercial credit to pay their workers, to buy new inventory, to pay their suppliers. And so they began going bankrupt. And as they went bankrupt, they laid people off. And as they laid people off, demand fell. And this is what does traumatic damage to the whole society. So traumatic that it's second only to the Civil War in, 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 in American memory as a tragic moment in American history. At a modest-sized insurance brokerage agency, one night at dinner, my father said that he had to fire an employee and I very cavalierly said, well, he'll be able to get a job, won't he? And my father said, no, he's an older man who isn't very capable, and uh, I don't think he can. And at that point, my father burst into tears. It was the first time I had ever seen my father cry. There was such a change in our lives and all the people around me after the crash. Many of my girlfriend's fathers lost their jobs and they couldn't pay the rent. They were evicted. The poverty was really all around us. Men had no clothing. They were in rags, really rags. They used to wrap their feet up in newspaper and put them in cardboard makeshift shoes to walk around the street. And then if you took a walk over to Central Park, you saw this big area, a deserted reservoir that had been drained. And they made little huts of cardboard boxes and they would sleep there overnight. And they called it Hooverville, because that was the name of our president at the time. And of course, all this stock market crash and all this poverty was of course put in his lap. It was really, really pitiful. But in 1932, 12 years of Republican rule came to an end. 
I have Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Democrat Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in a landslide victory. His first task was to restore confidence. Seen as a savior, Roosevelt promised a new deal for the American people and to regulate the financial system. There must be a strict supervision of all banking and credit and investment. There must be an end to speculation with other people's money. The new president acted quickly. He guaranteed bank deposits and introduced laws forcing bankers to operate under strict government supervision. An investigation into the crash was launched by the Senate Banking Committee. It would last more than three years, and the 10,000 pages of testimony blackened the reputation of Wall Street. The committee's ambitious lawyer, Ferdinand Bacora challenged the banking elite to account for their behavior. He calls these bankers to testify. And what does he learn? He learns that Charlie Mitchell of National City Corp had sold stock to his wife to avoid taxes. Richard Whitney, who had so boldly bought stock on Black Thursday, lost money of his own and began borrowing from his brother. Now that's where he began stealing from customers. And he ended up in jail doing time. The most prestigious bank in America, J.P. Morgan, was also found to be far from blameless. The hearings uncovered evidence of a list that offered preferential deals on stocks to friends in high places, including a former president. Not only Morgan partners and Morgan family members, but also prominent uh, corporate executives and uh, even some politicians. Calvin Coolidge was on the preferred stock list, for example. That was a practice that uh, uh, a lot of people felt was wrong. Fernand Picora had a great quote. He said it was shocking disclosures of low standards in high places, which I love because, you know, you could say the same thing today. In response to public outrage at the bankers' dirty dealings, President Roosevelt set up the Securities and Exchange Commission. Its task? To clean up Wall Street. At its head, he chose a man who knew more about unethical practice than most. President Roosevelt, when he introduced the Securities and Exchange Commission to regulate Wall Street, named his old friend and supporter Joe Kennedy to be the first chairman. And that's putting the fox in the chicken coop. Although Roosevelt restored confidence in the banking system, the Great Depression would last until the outbreak of World War II. Then, as now, the globalized economy meant that the crash and subsequent depression rippled out across the world. In Britain, there was a slump in manufacturing and millions lost their jobs. Germany, still suffering from defeat in the First World War, was hit even harder. So many people had their life savings destroyed during the Great Depression that it created in many countries a desire for some authoritarian government that would save them, that would rescue the uh, economy. No doubt the crash and the depression strengthened anti-capitalist movements. The communists had taken over in Russia and there were rising fascist movements. Mussolini was already in power in, in Italy and Hitler's political base was growing in Germany. And when American-style free market capitalism suffered from this Wall Street crash followed by a depression, it just strengthened those people who wanted to say, there's a better way. While communism and fascism prospered, many nations put up barriers to prevent free trade and turned inwards in an attempt to save their economies. Economic nationalism led to trade wars and later war on war. Eighty years on, those who remember the bubble of the 20s and the crash that followed feel that they have seen it all before. 
I don't think we learned anything from it. I have found that people's memories are very short. They make the same type of leveraged commitments where they don't look at the downside risk. We had a lot of cheap credit in the 1920s. Now we've had cheap credit and people have speculated on houses and now the housing bubble has collapsed. You have a heavily leveraged American consumer. He's in debt up to his eyeballs, uh, and he can't sustain that debt. The subprime mortgage crisis is a symptom of that. In the 80s and 90s, faith in the free market had revived. And as optimism returned, many of the financial regulations that Roosevelt had introduced were felt to be outdated and were slowly dismantled. Yet again, a lightly regulated market allowed speculation to grow unchecked. We are now reaping the world of that deregulation. In that sense, we're in exactly the same position as people were in 1929 when the government turned a blind eye to what was going on in the financial world. What I do hope and I do think is that the government has learned its lessons and is trying to take steps that are much more active and much more aggressive than what was taken in, in the 30s to try and stem the pain and stem the decline. The hope is that such steps will work. But the lessons from the crash of 1929 are that history repeats itself, that human folly and greed are much stronger forces in financial affairs than reason and restraint.